All right, everyone, I have on Aaron Steinberg today, and we are going to talk about baby proofing your relationship. Uh, everyone told me and Vito when we got married, like, wait, it seems easy now. Wait till you have kids. Wait till this thing happens. Wait till that, because uh, they do mix it up a little bit. Uh, and Aaron's going to bring us some great information today. He has a master's in psychology, a certificate in complex trauma practice, and a robust education in sex and relationships from the Gottman Institute and the Couples Institute, along with his experience working on his 11-year relationship and raising two boys. And through his personal struggles, he learned that having some information out there for couples going through this is much needed. So he set out to create courses for his clients um, that didn't exist yet to help them baby-proof their relationships. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm so excited to have you to talk about this. Um, so, I mean, I just talked a little bit about how you got into it, but I'd love for you to share uh, in your own words, like what brought you to start baby proofing your relationship? You never know how far back to go with these kind of <laughs> questions. Um, I suppose I'll start with just the context of I you know, for the last 12, I guess almost 13 years now, I, I've been in like the helping professions and some version of it. Um, I went to life coaching school in 2010 and then got my master's and have just been kind of accumulating like experience and training in this world. And, you know, like a lot of people in the helping professions, you kind of gravitate toward the things that you're dealing with at the time. And so what I was dealing with in 2015, 2016, 17, 18 was having a family, right? My wife and I had two kids uh, within two years and it was intense. And I, you know, I have always specialized in couples um, for the most part. So I thought I was pretty well equipped for this. And in some ways I was, and in some ways I was like, what is going on right now? This is not what I thought it was going to be. So I was actually, um, I was invited to teach a class on, um, on parenthood, right? How parenthood affects your romantic relationships for a nonprofit in the Bay Area. And this is where baby proofing your relationship come came from. I created baby proofing your relationship. And uh now I've just kind of made that my focus because I feel like it's something that's weirdly not talked about and is still kind of shrouded in like a lot of mythology. I was interested to hear you say your friend said, just wait till you have kids, just wait till you have kids, because a lot of people I talk to are actually thinking that having kids is going to be like a huge benefit to their relationship, which right. obviously in some ways it does bring you closer, but I just feel, I really love relationships, which we could get into the psychological <laughs> childhood stuff of that if we want to, but I just like really want for people to have really beautiful relationships. I think relationships are such a cool opportunity for a place of home and safety and growth and happiness. And I want that for everyone. So I want to do my part to help make that happen. Mm -hmm. I like what you said about people thinking that having a kid is maybe going to solve some issues. And I think we've all seen that happen. And in my mind, I'm always like, no, like you should probably work on your issues before you bring a kid into it. Because I mean, no relationships were perfect, you know, but, um, but also thinking this, like having a child is going to fix something. It doesn't like it, it. What I see is that it brings up more, which we're going to get into today. Just you don't realize what parental differences that you have, how you want to parent the kids. You may think that you've talked about it all or how you communicate is fine. But once you're sleep deprived and like, you know, trying to figure out parental load and different things, it's it can bring up so many other things that you didn't know were there. And yes, children add so much joy to our lives and they bring so much value. Like we love our girls as much as I haven't like slept through the night in so long. <laughs> like, I, I love my girls so much and, um, we can't wait to have more kids, but, um, I, I don't think that, I think that they've brought us closer because of certain choices that we've made and worked really hard at to make sure that we, had each other's back in different things versus like at each other's throat all the time. So it's, I definitely don't think like kids can fix a relationship. <laughs> I think you're, I think you're spot on. I think it's like an interesting sort of general 
thing that people sometimes think like I, I notice it with moving too it's like oh if we just switch up our environment like that will bring us closer together and obviously there's some reality to doing a new adventure together having to go through like being a team and that it makes sense with kids or in this moving example I brought up but I find that with the new thing like if you're trying to do something because you think it's going to automatically make you more connected and you're not connected now yeah. that's like almost certainly not going to happen right like all the ways in which you are still disconnected are probably actually going to get exacerbated and then you're adding in new opportunities to struggle and things to argue about and not be on the same page about. And I think you're just so right. It's like on average, it makes it a lot harder. It's not like, Oh yay, This is going to be the thing that finally like makes our relationship work. Like you have to make your relationship work on its own through all mm -hmm. of this adventure, you know? Right. Well, and if anything, I, in, in my own experience, kids have brought out a lot in me like things that I didn't know were there, things that I thought I had done the work on. Like I've worked through this thing. I've shattered this belief. I've done all this stuff. And then I have a little kid and I'm like, oh, that's still there. Like I'm getting triggered in these areas that I thought that I worked through. So they, they're little mirrors. They're going to bring up things that you didn't know were there, like from your own childhood. And I didn't even have like a traumatic childhood, but there's still stuff there that I'm like, holy crap. Like I actually just a couple months ago started going back to therapy because I'm like, wow, like there's things there that I don't want there. Like, you know, and I'll like get triggered and I'm like, okay, where, where is this coming from? And where do I put it? Like how, like my two-year-olds acting like a two-year-old and I want to act like a two-year-old. So <laughs> I'm like, I would like to just kick and scream as well. So like, you know, how can I work on regulating my own emotions and holding that space as a parent for my two-year-old trying to figure it out. And so there's so much stuff that comes up for yourself in parenting that it's like you're then working on your relationship in this redefining roles in these new roles that you have, redefining yourself in the new role you have as a mother, a father, as a parent, and then trying to keep these little kids alive and also reparenting yourself while you're learning how you, you want to be the parent that you want to be toward them. You know, it's like, it's so much. <laughs> so it's like, that's, there's like so many things that come up. So I feel like really creating that bond, like baby proofing your relationship, talking, having these conversations before you bring kids into the mix is so, so vital. You just expressed that so beautifully. I want to like take a recording of you explaining all of that and then put it at the front of the course. It's like, yeah, you'll see, have you'll have this recording. So simple. <laughs> <laughs> right. right, right. I mean, it it seems simple, but it's not. But I mean, that's like, you know, just kind of the experience that that we've had. We're like, whoa, like yeah. I always say parenthood's a trip. It's just such a trip. It, it's such a trip. I love what you said about um feeling like you're a two-year-old when you're interacting with your two-year-old in an earlier version of the course because I break it up into like pitfalls right like what are the most common pitfalls and what ended up becoming the communication one used to be called something like acting like a child ourselves right because of this exact thing it's like there is no quicker way to make you feel like you're not a mature adult anymore than trying to parent a toddler who's yeah. like resisting everything you're saying and fighting you every step of the way and not listening to anything. I'm like, I don't know what to do right now, except have a temper tantrum myself, but right, I'm not going right. to do that. So what do I do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think like part of it too, is just like realizing, I think parenthood is from day one, like as soon as you get pregnant, realizing you have no control, you can do everything right. And you don't know necessarily what will happen in your pregnancy, what the birth outcome is going to be like, and then having kids and you're like trying to help them co-regulate their emotions and do different things, but they're still going to have, they're still learning how to express things themselves. They're still learning all these different things. And you're like, wow, like, at least for me, like if my kid is having a complete meltdown, I'm like, wow, I have zero control of my life. Like it comes down to like this thing of control. So it's like, okay, what do I have control of? Like I can show up in these certain forms. I can like have good communication with my husband. I can, you know, like what are the things that I can control in my life or at least like show up <laughs> in 
And it's like, okay, I can still show up as a parent, but also know like that I can't control my two-year-old's emotions and how she's going to feel. So what does that say about me? Right? Like, that's like kind of the, I know we're like on a tangent now, but this is all part of it, right? Like trying to figure out like how to baby proof your relationship, because then we do like take it out on our partners. Yeah. Well, I think also like this control thing is really interesting, you know, because in the world that I come from, you know, therapy often is very like pigeonholed in this kind of cliche way into like, what did your parents do to you that traumatized you? Right. I mean, that thinking's a little bit old school, but still obviously development and, um, you know, how your parents impacted you and your system impacted you as a real thing. But then as I've become a parent, I realized that I think I was really overemphasizing a lot of that. And probably, I mean, and who knows, like what's genetics and yeah. all the things that we don't even know about life, but it's just like, I see my kids and I'm like, I have no idea where that came from. And I'm looking for it, right? Because of like being trained in therapy, right? And like very cautious of what I do. And I'm like, wow, you're just little me. And and then my other son is just little. My wife's name is Liz, actually. Also, I'm like, you're just little Liz, you know? And it's it's just wild. And I think the relational thing for me of that that's really interesting is also having more empathy for my Liz, for my partner, because, you know, it's like, I don't know. I feel like we just overemphasize control so much. And it's like, oh, you could be doing this better and that better and that better. And like, obviously we want, you know, to work on a relationship and give our partner feedback and create boundaries and accountability and all this stuff. But at the same time, I'm like, yeah, like you're in a pressure cooker with me. You don't have a lot of control over what's going on right now either. And that's scary. And all the stuff that you came into the world with is going to come up for you also. It's just, it's so complicated and, <laughs> you know, intense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it absolutely is. I want to touch on something you just said, like how, like, obviously we also want to like do feedback and accountability. And I think that that's something that a lot of people struggle with is receiving that. Um, I can speak from, you know, in, in my household, I am the primary caretaker at home. I, um, you know, I work from home part-time, just like doing the podcast and some doula stuff. But for the most part, I'm with my girls, um, and doing different things. And, I know that it's easy for me to take some things very personally when my husband's just trying to help me, trying to be like, to lighten my load. Like he can see when I'm overwhelmed, then be like, hey, why why not like this and try to give tips or whatever. And I'm like, I resort back to like some old beliefs that I have. And I'm like, well, you should have just married somebody else then, you know, like obviously I suck at doing this thing. Like a, B, and C, and I'm overwhelmed already. And he's like, whoa, 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 you know, <laughs> like not at all. Right. But like receiving that feedback when you're sleep deprived, when you're, you feel like you're doing the best that you can. And maybe some of it might not make sense. Maybe it would be easier if I did A, B, C. But from my point of view in what I'm in, it's hard like receiving that. Yeah. So I feel like yeah. the, the feedback and accountability is like really important, but also that's probably where some of the communication stuff ties in as well. Um, because it, sure. you can take it harsh and it's hard not to take things personally in an intimate relationship. Yeah, for sure. Can I, can I comment on that and yeah, give, absolutely. give some pointers here? Yeah. So the, it's, it's so huge. And what you're talking about is so huge. And I, I think there's two sides of it. And, and I talk about this some in the communication um, module in the course as well. It's like, I think there is being on the side of the person giving the feedback or the, or the support. I mean, in this example, right, it's an attempt at support um, that has feedback <laughs> layered into it, uh, you know, or the person receiving it. And I'll just separate those for the sake of the conversation, um, for the sake of clarity. For the person um, who's sharing it, I think it's important to not try to like do things very efficiently and synthesize all the things that you're feeling into one perfect sentence, right? Like in all these cases, multiple things are true at the same time. And as the sharer or the person giving feedback, we have to represent that, right? It's like, I'm not saying like, I just like, I want to give you support right now. I don't want to make you feel like you're not doing a good job. That's not where this is coming from. I think you're an amazing mom. And I, it seems like this is kind of overwhelming. Like, can I step in and do this thing that it seems like would be better, right? It takes like another 20 seconds, but to have that 
knowing and hearing that your partner isn't implying something negative about you through this thing helps so much receive it because then you don't even have to go there. You don't have to assume it. You understand the whole context of the situation, right? So when we're giving our partner feedback, we want to make sure as much as we can and are aware of it to say all the different pieces of what we're feeling, you know, and, and to the best extent we can be aware of those little sore spots in our partner. Right. And this is, this is the other side of it is on the receiving feedback. And like, I think that a lot, I mean, there's the foundation that we are really overwhelmed a lot and, and you use the word regulation. It's a word I use too, right. It refers to our nervous system and how it's feeling overstimulated or understimulated, like being a parent, you're going to be over, you're going to be alternating a lot, like crashes and getting hyped up and crashing. And that is not a great place to receive feedback from. So, but obviously there's very little we can do about this, but the thing that we do have some control over is our sense of self, right? Like when you're, forgive me for just assuming your thing, can I use it as an example for a, a little yeah, thing? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's like, what is it that makes you go to, well, you should have married someone else, which by the way, I'm so with you. I <laughs> said that to my wife too, you know, but it's like, what is the thing that you're feeling about yourself or that your partner's implying about you, you know, that's different than how you want to feel about yourself and how you want to be experienced by your partner, right? So in that moment, it might be like, I'm not, oh, I'm, it seems like he's saying I'm not good enough for him or yeah. I'm a bad mom or I suck or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's going to make are exactly what I say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty good at this after yeah. 13 years. Um, yeah. So, you know, we have to be aware of where we go, right? right? So on the receiving end, we can go, you know, when I, and, and this is, you know, I, I get this all sounds kind of like a lot of over communicating, but I think actually that's very important in mm -hmm. relationships, at least, you know, as if you're getting upset with each other, where you can kind of go, okay, like, I think you're trying to give me support. All I hear you saying is that I'm a bad right. mom and mm -hmm. I can't get out of that. I assume that's not what's happening. Can you just give me more, like, what are you trying to do right now? Yeah. Right. And you make it this connect. And so like, you're doing these two opposing things in parallel, like as long as yeah. one of you can do it, you're probably going to be good, you know? And so mm -hmm. it allows you to connect through that moment of difficulty, feel like a team, as opposed to how it goes for most people is like, your husband would say, Hey, you know, it seems like you're really overwhelmed. Can I step in here? And you're like, Oh yeah, I get it. I'm a bad mom. Okay. You probably marry someone else next time. And then you storm out of the room. You never can talk about it ever again and be like, this is what was really happening for me. It gets swept under the rug and you are emotionally pulled apart in your partnership by that moment, which is unfortunately how it goes for most people. And yeah. those moments add up so fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think too, like the good thing with us is like, I'm, I'm aware that it's my stuff that's like being triggered and coming up. So like, I have like, that's kind of like my resort to is like, oh, I'm not good enough. And oh, like, yeah, oh, I just suck. So, um, but like, since we've like had those conversations, like I can be like, that's what I'm hearing when you say this. I know that that's not true, but that's like what I'm telling myself. So like, we can talk about it like that, you know? And obviously that's not what he means. <laughs> And that's not what he's saying. And I know that. Um, but again, parenting just like brings up so many things. And so it's it's good that like we have that communication, that we can do that. But I could see like, you see how not communicating your needs adds up so much or um, like talk about like the parental load a little bit because, um, which I also think really plays into sex and intimacy. I know like for us, if I wasn't communicating to him the help that I needed, um, let's say I go put my daughter down and she's needing some extra support. So I'm there for a while. And then I would come down and I still have to clean up dinner or I still have to whatever. Then it's like, we never get to spend time together when I'm exhausted by the end of the night. And so he learned pretty quickly that if like he does all the dishes, cleans up after dinner while I put the girls down, we're free to spend time with each other for sex and intimacy, to cuddle on the couch, whatever it is. But if I'm coming down and I have a lot to do still, it's never going to happen. So like figuring out helping each other's loads, I feel like also kind of leads into the intimacy factor too, which is also communicating what you need. So it's like all intertwined. 
it's all intertwined. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's like, it's such a good point because there's literally the time of it, right? It's like, if there's a bunch of stuff that one of you has to do, then literally you're not going to have time to spend together. Mm -hmm. But then also if you start to accumulate this feeling of like, I'm not talking about you specifically, but right. me or any of us, like accumulate this feeling of I'm there's way too much on me, right? Then the next thing your brain does is there's way too much on me because my partner is too X, right? Selfish, distant, whatever, you know, then that's not sexy, right? Like that's yeah. not a person you want to connect with that you're judging as being too selfish and not supportive, you know? So it all, it really, it really does blend together quite easily, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you like come at the unequal parent load I guess when um because I feel like times have changed so much right like guys used to go to work the women stayed home took care of everything now there's a lot of where both parents are in the workforce but there still tends to be like a primary caregiver um or even you know, somebody's now, you know, there's so much that comes out. That's like, even if you are a stay at home mom, like it's a lot of work, it's a full-time job. It's not like you're just sitting at home doing nothing all day. Um, and you might have, you know, a partner who's like working really hard and like, it's like just such like a different conversation for every single person, I guess, or every relationship mm -hmm. figuring out what works. And I feel like there's probably like a big unmet expectation there that maybe isn't communicated um, when it comes to unequal parent load. But like, how do you bring that up, I guess? Yeah, I think, I think there's a bunch of different ways to think about this. I mean, first of all, it's sort of like a baseline. I don't personally have like a take that one way of dividing things is better than another. I think everyone's relationship is different. Everyone has different values. Everyone has different desires. And what I feel is important is that from, from my vantage point as a practitioner, that I can give you information and doorways that allow you to figure out what that looks like for you in the best way possible, you know? So I'm not trying to pigeonhole any way, anyone into a particular way of doing things, first of all. Um, on the education part of it, I think it is cool that we've made a lot of progress in terms of just the way that we think about this, right? Like, to your point, there's so much data and ways of, of talking about how, you know, working for most people, right? Most jobs that people do to earn money are just not as time consuming physically or emotionally demanding as being a parent. It's just not the case, right? Like for, for most people, you go to work and you're getting a lot of breaks or, you know, you might be working on a spreadsheet or even if you're doing physical labor, it's like the intensity on your nervous system and picking up a baby and putting it down. And if you're a mom and you're breastfeeding, that's wild. It seems like, you know, so, so one thing I think is just understanding the, like, and this has happened. And I think it's cool that what it means to divide something is different than we used to think of it. Right. Like one thing I say to people is that one person working quote unquote, and one person managing the home is, is not an equal division of responsibility. It's just not in my opinion. And I think that's just validated. Both of those things for me are included in what I refer to as the family system, right? Like all the responsibilities that you have, the assets that need to be tended to, your own well being, your kids' well being, like all of that that makes your family operate and function and everyone in it feel good. I call a family system and earning resources and taking care of the kids and doing home stuff are all within that. So I think. It's important to think about what is a satisfying family system for each of you, right? Is that going to be both of you earning some amount of money? Is there some places where there isn't a lot of choice where just one of your earning potential is just much better than the other? So that's what they're going to do. And the other of you is going to be with the kids and, and do other things. And how do you manage the things that kind of fall outside of work hours? Like when one of you gets home, does it become a switch or does it become you both are splitting something equally? Like my wife and I, you know, one of us does bedtime with the kids and the other one of us cleans the house and does the dishes and then we switch every night, right? So whatever's happened during work hours, we're like, okay, that's 
pretty equal, like we're managing whatever. And then anything in the morning or night we're switching, right? And people have different desires and tolerances for like control and organization and specificity, right? Some yeah. people don't need to do that and that's fine. But so I think first of all, just understanding like, you know, just doing home versus work is not fair, so to speak. And I don't think is going to create satisfaction for most people. It might, you know, some person might be like, I love taking on all of this and it just feels really good to me. Um, and so using that as a baseline for conversation. And then I actually have a list of like all, you know, this has become a thing lately with um, fair play and, and these other uh, resources where it's like, here's a list of all the stuff, right? This is something I have too. And, you know, here are all the things that require attention or here are the areas that require attention and actually have that conversation as a collaboration, as a team, as best you can and try to figure that out. But I think really like the most important thing <laughs> is recognizing that you're not going to get that right right? You're making epic guesses, like in pregnancy at the beginning of parenthood, like you're making epic guesses about yeah. how you're going to feel, what's going to feel satisfying, what's going to feel fair. And you need to update that all the time. Like I mm -hmm. tell people have a weekly meeting where you're just like, this is our weekly meeting. How's it going for you? How's it going for you? What's working? What's not working? What are you enjoying? What do you wish you could do differently? you know, but what can't we do? What do I need to be heard about? What are we going to try this week? Right? Like you can switch things up, try new ways of intervening. And so it becomes a little bit of like built into your relationship and not so overwhelming. Cause if there's something you're going to switch up, you're just trying it for a week, yeah. <laughs> seeing how it feels. Does it change the satisfaction? Um, mm -hmm. And then doing it over. And it's so problematic because it's really hard to know what someone else's experience is like, right? Mm -hmm. It would be nice if somehow we could, you know, I could sort of put myself in my wife's consciousness for a yeah. day and vice mm -hmm. versa and really get it, you know? Yeah. So I think like empathy is very important to just like really get what your partner is holding, even if you judge it as not that valuable, you know? Mm -hmm. Cause I think yeah. there's a hazard like, I think it's so beautiful what's going on with all this information and studies and all this stuff and creating a greater sense of equality. There's also a hazard here where I feel like sometimes I'll work with couples and they'll be like, making money doesn't matter, you know, and just sort of disrespecting the parent who's mm. going out and earning resources. Yeah. And I'm just kind of like, well, that matters. None of this is possible. You know, obviously I'm working with this in a therapeutic context, yeah. but in, yeah. you know, educationally, it's like, it all matters. It's all important. You know, mm -hmm. everyone's caring a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And also sometimes people are phoning in and I don't know, it's just so, it's so complicated, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love what you said though. Just kind of like, like you wish that you could get in their consciousness sometimes and like just having empathy toward your partner. Cause I, I do feel like once I started to, I guess like a conversation that like my husband and I have had a lot is like, he does physical labor. He's a construction worker. So he's a laborer. He like works so hard every single day and he's tired. And I'm also tired. I'm also up a couple of times a night and nursing and, you know, up with kids, whatever. Um, but like, we can't compare, like we're tired in different ways. And like, we have different parental roles at times. And like, like conversations around like not complaining. Like it, I think it's really easy to try to one up each other when it's like, I'm tired. And the other parent being like, well, I'm tired too. And it's like, okay, but we can both be tired. I can't say like my tiredness is more valid than your tiredness or my tiredness is more important than your tiredness or my, whatever it is. Like I'm able to do what I do because my husband does what he does. And like, you know, when he and I sat down once and we were like talking about kind of like our parental burdens that we have. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I'm actually really glad that I don't have the financial burden of our home. Like I I'm like, wow, like that's a lot. That's a lot on you to be putting out bids, making sure you're getting work lined up so that we have the insurance we do so that we can pay our bill. You know, like it's a lot. And I'm like, wow, like I, I'm glad that I don't have that role right now. Like I, 
you know, and, and he validates like my role, like <laughs> our, our girls are wild, like, you know, and it's, it's fun and it's also chaos and it's draining. And so it's, it is a lot, but I think it's really easy to try to one up each other when it comes yeah. to those things where it's like, yeah, I'm tired too. Yeah. I'm exhausted too. Yeah. I'm stressed out too. I'm overwhelmed too. I'm, you know, like, it's like, okay, we well, get it. We're all that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, first of all, yeah, it is, a, it's a lot of pressure to, to support a family for sure. And, and also I, I think the secret that the secret to all of this is like actually something different than we think. Like we get so hyper-focused on the tasks, right. And the division of tasks and who's doing what and are those things fair. But what I found over and over and over again is actually, it's not about perfectly dividing up the tasks. It's about having a sense of team, having mm -hmm. a sense that you're in it together, you know, because there's this really narrow sort of fine line we're trying to hit because in couples therapy for a long time, one of the things that people used to think a really long time ago is that if you could just like perfectly create like equivalent giving and receiving a relationship would be satisfying in, I think the seventies or eighties, that was, that was proven wrong. And so then what came out of that was never, ever, ever have transactional stuff, right? Where you're feeling like I'll do this, you do this, or, or, but really what it means is I'll do this only if you do this. Mm -hmm. But like an extension of that is we're arbitrating, right? Like you're saying, like we're arbitrating, like who's more tired, who's contributing more. The truth of the no transaction thing is that's not going to get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. The shortcoming of the no transaction thing is you're never going to not think about whether or not you're carrying a burden or not be annoyed with your partner in specific moments where you feel like you're doing more or whatever. This is just how our brain operates. So coming back to the point, we're hitting this very narrow line of like being honest about how we feel, creating like, you know what? I do feel like I'm doing more right now. I need more support from you or can we try this or whatever? but at the same time doing it in a way where you are collaborating with each other, yeah. right. And in each other's worlds and not a way of like, just for the sake of creating fairness, you know, for its own sake, it's for the sake of creating mutual satisfaction and a sense of team and connection with each other. That is really the most important part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely agree there. Um, I think we were talking before I hit record uh, about how, somebody like, I don't remember where we, where we heard it, but somebody had told us kind of about that teammate mentality and like, okay, we are a team. Like we're not against each other. We're for each other. We're trying to like problem solve together. It's not me against you. We want what's best for our family. We both do, even though we don't see eye to eye on these things, but we're still on the same team. And I think that that mentality is so, so important. Um, I would say crucial. Yeah, like, like yeah. is it, it, you, you can't succeed without it because there's so many places like this is true also without kids, but like, there's so many places in relationships where it feels like the things that each of you need don't fit together. You're just like, how can I give you extra time and attention when I need extra space and alone time, right? You're like, <laughs> how does that work? You know? And with kids, it's like, I want them to, you know, play X thing and have X experience. Well, it's like, well, I don't want to push them too hard and force them to do so, you know, and these things don't seem like they fit together. And I think the natural question that arises when people hear conversations like the one we're having is like, okay, that's nice. But how do you actually become a team when you don't feel yeah. like a team? Right. And I think one way to answer that is that we stop these conversations way too early with not enough sort of creativity and persistence of an understanding of nuance as they could have. Like what it feels like when I'm saying, how am I going to give you more attention when I'm needing more space is like only one of those things can win. Mm -hmm. But in reality, even with kids, there is enough time and our bodies and our ways of feeling about ourselves and all this stuff have enough resilience and capacity that like you could actually get 
20 minutes of alone time. And then you might find yourself feeling like, you know, I really want to connect with you. And there are time for both of those things. And I feel like this becomes this mutual exclusivity thing. And people don't realize there actually is room for both. And you can get creative, right? What really meets this need? What, you know, what would really nail it for giving my kid that, that skill or that value, you know, like, I feel like we're kind of, um, we're like two, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Whatever the opposite of like subtle and complex is mm -hmm. like, we're just kind of, you know, trying to like fit these oversized blocks in together. And really the blocks don't have to be that big and push the other one out of the way. That's not a great analogy, but that's what's coming up <laughs> for me right now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I see that. Um, yeah. And, and everything that you're saying is kind of leading me to the, the sex and intimacy part, because that is a big part of a relationship. And I remember when I was younger, growing up being told like, that's like, you know, sex isn't the most important thing in a marriage. It's whatever. And I, I feel like my husband and I would argue like, no, it's, it's pretty like <laughs> important. Like even like recently, like nothing was going on, just we've both been busy. So I'm like, I feel so distant from you. Like it's not that he's keeping anything from me or like whatever. We've both just been like really busy and his work's been busy and I've been busy and um, we haven't had a chance to just like sit down and connect like we normally do. Um, but even like when we've been at odds about something, I feel like that's kind of the one thing that we share, you know, like that's the one thing that can reconnect us. That's the thing. Like I can be like, I'm still mad at you. <laughs> like I still don't agree with you, you know, but then it's almost like more lighthearted in some way. Um, but I do think it's like such a vital part of a relationship and being in the birth world, I hear from so many moms that like that first year postpartum, that it's really, really hard for them. Um, and that they go like really long periods in their relationship without having sex and intimacy. Um, and there could be other underlying things going on. Like, obviously your hormones are different. Like there's actual things that happen because when you're breastfeeding a baby and right after you've had a baby, your body is saying like, Hey, let's not get pregnant yet. You know, <laughs> like let's put out these things. That's why sometimes like they say, which it's not, there's a different method to it, but like breastfeeding can keep like your period from coming back for a while. It's your body's way of being like, Hey, we're nurturing one child. Now let's not have another one yet. Um, obviously didn't work for us. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we got pregnant while I was nursing. Um, so it's, you know, like there's underlying things there, but even if your hormones are off or different sex and intimacy is still an important part of a relationship. So I guess like, how do you talk to couples who are in just kind of that new parental role of like, our lives just got turned upside down. We're trying to figure this out. We're not sleeping. We're, you know, maybe at odds at different things. Uh, I mean, we just don't have the support postpartum that we're meant to have in general. Like we were meant to be in community and doing this, not on your own doing it all. Um, you know, so we do kind of like live in a different time as far as like that, but it's still something that like, you can't just like not be intimate with your partner for a year. Yeah. Well, first of all, like a plus, however many comments you made a plus seven, plus eight to do every plus one to every one of those comments. Yeah. Um, I to I'm totally with you. Um, yeah, it's such a, it's such a tough thing. A lot of my work, like a lot of my work is about kind of the principle of including multiple realities in your relationship and in your way of thinking, right. That like multiple things can be true at the same time. Multiple mm -hmm. feelings can be true at the same time. Like in this case, you can want to connect with your partner and have literally no sexual desire or something like that. Right. So one thing I do is I just try to help couples bring out all of the different things that they're feeling. Right. Because sometimes it can just feel so sort of reductive and like, Oh, I want to have sex and you don't, or, you know, I'm still into you and you're not. And it just becomes very contentious and just like not real, right? Like none of that's real. It's like way more complicated than that. It's like, I really want to have sex with you. I still desire you a lot. And also I get that you're not feeling it. And, you know, like we don't even have any time and I'm also exhausted and I would kind of be forcing myself, but I really do want to force myself. And then it's mm -hmm. like, 
I, I have literally no physical desire. The idea of being touched by anyone is repulsive to me, but I also miss you and I want to connect with you. And I'm, you know, feeling really sad about this and I'm scared about what's going to happen to our relationship. You know, it's like, that's the reality. It's a bunch yeah. of stuff like that. So that's one thing is just helping people have those conversations. But I think with sex and intimacy, we're balancing kind of two opposing realities. And I think you spoke to both of them. One is that it's just true. This is not going to be the sexiest time in your life for most people. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> there's some, you know, you never know what, what right. people have or they're into or whatever. But for most of us, this is not going to be a sexy time, right? Like we're exhausted. We don't feel that good about ourselves. There's no time. We might be worried a baby's going to cry at any moment. Oh, you know, they whatever. do. It's so we, we, <laughs> so my, my youngest were like, man, we used to always say like, she was the biggest cock blocker. Like anytime, like we went to try to have sex, she would start crying. It was like without fail. And we're like, oh my God. <laughs> I know it. There's, oh God, it's so crazy. How does how she that know? <laughs> I know. How does she know? Right. She just sensed that you're like not attuned to her. You're attuned right. to each other now. Right. She's like, uh-uh, that's not happening. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah. So we have to have like a lot of you know, understanding, empathy, compassion, you know, I would say, especially if there's a biological mom or, or, a, um, you know, primary caregiver, I think that's going to be much more intense kind of the way that it lands, and especially if breastfeeding, right. It's going to be a lot more intense on the way that that lands. It seems like where the desire just might not be there. You know, as I said, the idea of being touched might even feel like repulsive, you know, for some period of time, or, you really don't feel connected to your partner, right? Maybe they're working super long hours and you just don't see them. And it's like, how could I have sex with you right now? I don't even like know you right now, right? There's just all this stuff in the way. And so it's like, we have to honor that side of it and go, this is all normal, you know, to a large extent, you know, there, obviously there's a bell curve with all these things. Sometimes people are using it as, as an excuse, but you know, this is all normal and, expected and it's not going to last forever right like these sentiments about like don't worry about and to see the first year so on and so forth on the other hand to your other point like it is really important like i would say i mean i don't know how aggressively i want to say this but i think it's probably true that your relationship is not really going to make it and like uh you know, a really connected way if you don't prioritize your intimate life in some yeah. way, even through those difficulties. And I think it is a means of, of connection, right? Like it is a means of coming back to each other. And, you know, there's so much re like sex, we oversimplify so much, you know, for most of us. And it's so complex. It's like a physical experience. It's a pleasure experience. It has something to do with our sense of self-worth for a lot of us. It can even be a spiritual experience, right? Like mm -hmm. sex is sex and sexuality and intimacy is very complicated. So I think one of the ways that you can dive into this other side of making it a priority is just doing your best to utilize what you have going for you, right? It's like, you know, you might not want to have like whatever you consider full on sex, right? Like some penetrative sex or something, but maybe you do want to like lie naked together and make out or do massages or whatever, and kind of just see how things progress. Like, I think some of it is being more open to the gray areas of intimacy, not even necessarily having to, sometimes you do need to make a choice in advance. Like this is happening yeah. tonight. Mm -hmm. No, no way around it. Right. And make it sort of sacred. And other times it's like, I don't know if I'm open to this, but I am open to like cuddling and even making out and kind of seeing where we get to, you know, and accessing more of what we call in, in sex therapy, responsive desire, right. Where it's like, once you kind of get into it, you might not think you want something. And then once you get into it, maybe that arises. So it's, I, that's how I think about it is just kind of balancing these two realities. Like one is having compassion for this time period and each other. And the other is stretching ourselves to prioritize things. And I think also just like, it's probably going to be a mess to some extent. Like you might get, you know, I don't know, not for everyone, but you might get really mad at each other or frustrated or sad or, you know, dejected or scared or whatever it is. In some moments you might be so pumped and like, wow, we got this back or whatever. There's just such a wide spectrum of possibilities. And um, I think we just need to know this and like avoid the sort of spiral of we're, 
effed, you know, like we're never yeah. going to get this back. Like, you know, because right. things change so much as things progress, like a day feels like a year when you have an infant, right. But it's like not that long until you get some sense of self and independence back, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and I would argue for my husband that a week feels like a year if we haven't had sex. So <laughs> <laughs> totally. like if it's been like a certain amount of time, he's like, it's been months. I'm like, oh my gosh, babe, it has not been months. Okay. Um, but, but we do realize in our relationship, at least like when we're bickering more than normal, we haven't been intimate like yeah. we normally are. We're like, wait, it's been a little bit longer than usual. You know, no wonder we're at each other's throats. And like I said, it's just like stupid little bickering. And it's not even like, you know, it's just like making time for that intimacy and connection. I think because we are busy at this season in our life, that's like, okay, this is what brings us back together. Like, I'll be like, man, everything he's doing is annoying me right now, you know, or like vice versa. And we're just like, so annoyed with each other. And it's like, oh, well, we haven't like been intimate in a while. Um, but I'd love to hear kind of like a little bit the men's perspective. Cause I feel like, um, it's hard for maybe the male partner to understand. I know, like I was watching the video mm -hmm. that you and your wife did on sex and intimacy and like, obviously you've done a lot of work. Like you, you, you've done a lot of self-work you're in this field. So it was probably like a little bit different for you versus just like the average show, but like, you know, like having that conversation and like understanding that this season of life might look a little bit different. It doesn't mean that I don't love you. It doesn't, cause like you said, it is some self-worth too. Like, it doesn't mean that I don't desire you that I don't, that I'm not still attracted to you or whatever it is. Um, but it can like be hard with like, you hear so many moms saying like, I'm just touched out. I'm touched out. And, um, I'm a super affectionate parent, like person. So like, I'd never really felt touched out, but I did get to a point with, with my husband or I'm like, I need you to like, not just touch me sexually. Like every single time you, you touch me, you're grabbing my butt. You're like humping me from behind in the kitchen. Like, you know, like I need you to like touch me. I need that physical touch, but not you doing something sexual. Like, I just need to know, like just walking by and honking my boob, like, okay, like, come on, you know, like I need, <laughs> I need like a, a sexual touch without me feeling like it needs to lead somewhere like every once in a while or like a physical touch, you know, like, so it did become more like that for me, like after kids where I'm like, ugh, like I'm trying to cook and you're just like, you know, like <laughs> whatever. So like, we had to have like that conversation. Um, and like, don't get me wrong. I love it when he walks by me and like slaps my butt or whatever, but like, it's also, you know, you go through like these different seasons and, um, and I feel like sometimes like maybe guys aren't empathetic to that changing role for us that we go through. For, for sure. I think, well, there's so much to say here. I mean, and you can simplify it as much as you want. No, like you don't no, have to no. Like well, too deep. <laughs> yeah. I just, well, I think you're, you're so right. I mean, I, well, so I'll talk about, you know, the guy side, so to speak, just in, in my own experience for, uh, in a second, I just, in terms of what you just said, I mean, this is one of the things that like, I sort of wish that I could somehow, I don't know, like deliver a PSA that everyone got of just like, you just don't get what it's like to be your wife, right? Like in a heterosexual relationship, like you just don't get what it's like to be your wife, like, like these things you're talking about and, and like somehow creating a lot more compassion and empathy for, for that experience, you know, because I don't know. I don't, I, I only know what it's like to be my wife or to be a mom because I'm a therapist basically. Right. Because I have experience trying to understand where people are coming from and have practiced it over a long period of time, you know? And so I have a leg up there. Um, but it's, it's like from both sides, again, it's really, really hard to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And also it's like, we really need to take better care of our wives, I feel like, you know, and understand where they're coming from better. Now, that being said, I'll share about my own experience, because this wasn't something I necessarily knew from the beginning, even, even given my background, right? Like, I, for me, um, 
if this was a really, 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 really difficult thing for me. Um, I'm a person who it, is it okay for me to just share <laughs> vulnerably yeah, yeah. about my about my okay, cool. Um, you know, I'm a person who did have kind of the personality type where I got some of my self-worth from having sex, like, oh, I'm desirable, I'm attractive, you know, someone trusts me enough to want to share their body with me, sort of thing, right? Like that was meaningful to me. And I I knew that for a long time. And it sometimes that came out sort of more compulsively and in in negative ways. And sometimes it was something that I knew about and it could become more connective, like in my marriage or something, right? And just kind of working with that kind of stuff. But when for me, it became really, really difficult when we had our second kid. Um, like you, my kids are less than two years apart. Um, and that was really gnarly on us. Um, our second, our second kid was a pretty tough baby. Um, you know, what, whatever colic actually is, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, he definitely was felt fell under that definition and we weren't, we were not in a good place personally, you know, and then also that we were just struggling, you know, to make the money and take care of the kids and do all the things. And, about a year into having two kids, you know, we kind of did our best, right? But we were getting more and more distant and frustrated with each other. I think I was really missing Liz and feeling really disconnected from her. And like, she, I didn't matter to her, frankly. Um, and she, I think she was feeling really frustrated with me and that I was dramatic and, <laughs> um, you know, all this kind of stuff, which but I think both things were were true. I think she had kind of turned away from me. And I think I was very dramatic and everything. I think we were both right in some way. And, um, so, uh, about a year and we had kind of like this really terrible experience where we came back from a wedding and, and we kept saying to each other, like, once we get to a year of two kids, we're going to be in such a better place. And it set this sort of dumb expectation that ended up not being true. And we weren't in a better place. And I remember we came back from this wedding and I was hoping we were going to have sex and. I can't remember exactly what happened, but basically what I, what I remember from it was I was just like a disaster. You know, I was just so upset. I felt so alone. Somehow it seemed like every rejection pain I had ever had was like wrapped up in that one experience. It was just wild. And that started a period of time of fighting like incessantly for quite a, quite a bit, um, got us back into couples therapy and, I think that what, for me, I was just like, this isn't okay. Like, I'm not willing, you know, my parents got divorced when I was very young. And one of the reasons I got really into relationships was just observing how from the outside, it seemed to me people are very unhappy in their relationships on average, right? And there's, you know, some amount of statistics to back up that most mm -hmm. people are unhappy in their relationships. And so I was like, I refuse, I refuse to have that happen. So for me, it became this thing of like, this isn't okay with me. I'm not going to have a marriage like this. I'm not going to have a sexless marriage. I'm not going to have a disconnected marriage. Like this is not what I signed up for. And even in the midst of what was going on, right. Having a three-year-old and a one-year-old, I was like, I don't care. You know, I'm not willing to have a sexless marriage. Like I need to feel connected to you. This is not what we're doing. If you want to, like, I remember having being such a you know, not a great person, <laughs> uh, a bunch and being like, you know, that thing we were talking about earlier, I'd be like, if you want to have a marriage like that, then you should be with someone else. Right. Cause I'm, I'm not willing to do that. Not, not my finer moments, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I think what, what turned it around for us was just really kind of turning the lens on ourselves together and looking at like, what is true about what, what our partner is saying. Like for me, you know, just how dependent I am on her, how needy I was of her smothering, how much pressure I was putting on her sexual experiences and for it to go a certain way, you know, not giving her enough space to be who she was and, you know, hear her and, and respect what was going on for her. And, um, you know, like working on my sense of independence and taking care of myself and getting support outside of her, right. And not being, her third kid, you know? Um, and I think for her, it was doing the opposite, right? Like looking at the ways in which she was, you know, 
making excuses and turning away from me. And instead of saying what was really going on for her, just taking the easier route of reading or whatever. And, um, and, and what you said too, you know, about getting these to these nuances of like, I need you to touch me other ways. Right. Like I think, uh, in our interview in the course, she said this, I, I can't totally remember. It's like, like everything can't like every makeout can't lead to sex. Every kiss can't lead to sex. Every hug can't, you know, it's like, that's right. not working. There has to yeah. be connection between us, you know? So we, I mean, this was, my kids are almost seven, five now. So it was about four, almost four years ago that, that this, like the worst, probably the worst day of my life, maybe, um, <laughs> happened. Um, and, uh, and it's just, we're, you know, we're still working on it, you know, like we still, like we put a lot of attention on the health of our relationship. But, um, I think for me, it was, you know, this phrase is thrown in a lot in therapy, like taking responsibility, yeah. um, for my own side of it and also mm -hmm. her taking responsibility and us collaborating. But yeah, I guess I, to, to like the overarching question you asked, like from my side, it was just like, you know, it went from, I feel really angry with you, disconnected, dissatisfied, unwilling to relate like this and, and not throwing all that away. Right. Cause that was true, but then also going further into that and understanding all these other things and not just playing the blame game, but also balancing my dissatisfaction with what I was bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. I feel like you said two things in there that were very like things that I hear from couples a lot that are very true. Um, you said that I'm not a third kid. Like you hear a lot of moms be like, well, I have three kids. Well, actually four, you know, like they're like, my husband's basically a, a child. <laughs> so like you hear that a lot. Um, cause sometimes you do feel like you're taking care of like an extra kid. Um, whether it's like, you know, just little, whatever it is, but also when you're saying that, you didn't matter to her. Like that's how you were feeling. I also can see that so much because even like in the, it's like so easy to get in this like role of motherhood and you're trying to do the best you can. You're trying to keep these kids alive. And I think it's really easy for your partner to feel like they don't matter anymore. And even like with parental decisions that my husband and I have disagreed on, like he's said, like, it doesn't matter what I think you're going to do what you want anyways, mm. you know, like, because I'm like, no, I have this motherly intuition. I'm right. I'm whatever. Like I'm the one home with them all day. And then it's like, no, wait, like, okay, I do value your input. I do value, you know, like bringing it back. But I do think that that's like such a valid way also for like the women listening that like, it's probably really easy for your partner to feel like they don't matter to you when you're in this season of life. Well, I mean, from, from like an attachment theory perspective, that's literally true. Like yeah. you've, you know, you've bonded, you, you and your partner have bonded together and become each other's primary, you know, right. like safe place. I mean, attachment basically is synonymous with just your home base, right? Your place of safety. All of a sudden, one or both of you has turned that toward the kid. And that is very, very scary and unsettling, whether you're aware of it or not, right? Like whether you're a person who's very sensitive to that or you're a person who's pretending that doesn't matter to you, you know, and just overriding that and being like, I don't care, I'm fine. You know, like it's happening biologically, whether whether you're aware of it or not. And that's that's really intense. So I think it is really important to be sensitive to that. Like if we're, you know, talking about a man-woman dynamic, like you know, for the woman to be sensitive, like if you are now a mother, your partner is by definition rejected from both a biological sense and probably an identity sense. And that feels really painful. On the other hand, as we talked about way at the beginning, parenting is a time where you see all of your childlike crap, like right in front of you in the mirror, and it's time to grow up. Like there's a lot of boys out there, you know, <laughs> not, not, I'm not throwing stones in a glass house. I, I am, I am still, and have been one of them, you know, but, but like, we got to grow up and, and not, you know, need to be told how to like go grocery shopping and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, I like how you explain kind of like the attachment theory. Cause I do think that that's, it does make sense. It makes so much sense. Um, 
And, and like for people listening to, like, I feel like having these conversations is so important, which is why Aaron created the baby proofing course, which is awesome. Cause you were saying earlier, like, I wish I just had this like PSA thing out there. And I'm like, well, you kind of do through your course, right? <laughs> like <laughs> it might not like reach everybody, but like getting that message out there. Um, I, I mean, I even keep learning because since I'm a birth worker, I'm like so passionate about that, you know, I'm like, people go to college, they plan their marriage, but they don't plan anything when it comes to having babies. Like they're like, Oh, I'll just go with this doctor, this, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then like, things might not go as they planned. And it's like, no, like there's so much work you can do to like be prepared for the situation, to be prepped, to have, you know, a, the proper team in place. But the same comes for your relationship too, that we don't, we don't think about that. We're like, let's just throw a baby into the mix. <laughs> And see what happens instead of like having, you know, putting work toward it. Um, I mean, I know that there's like premarital counseling that like some people do uh, and things like that, but you don't really think about like pre-parenting <laughs> type of yeah, stuff. Yeah, well, I, I'm trying, I mean, that's literally what I'm trying to do, you know, from, from beyond kind of like a sort of, hey, I've got this cool course that you should do, like you know, there's more wrapped up in it for me. Um, you know, cause, cause I hate, I hate saying so boxy things like this, but it is true that like our culture hasn't attended to this and it's extremely important. And I want for everyone, you know, and obviously I, I think I made a great thing, but I want for everyone in some way to be like, you know, we take a newborn care class, we take a labor and delivery class, we buy a stroller, we set up the nursery, we prep our relationship, right. That that's just in our culture of like, that's a thing you obviously do. And no one's not aware of that. You know, that would be like a dream come true for me of, of where this goes. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and it is, it is like needed. And I also feel like it's so easy in general to like point fingers at other people. So like, even in the relationship, well, this is like your problem. This is whatever, or like, you know, listening to this and be like, oh, I know this couple that needs this course, or I know whatever, but you also like have to look at your own relationship and look at yourself too. Like I was thinking about that the other day too, like going to church. It's like so easy for me, like hearing a message and be like, oh, this person should hear this. And then I'm like, oh, wait, Liz, like, why don't, why don't you just listen instead of thinking about who should hear this message, <laughs> you know? Like, uh, I, lo I love, I love that, that <laughs> self-awareness. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's so true. Like I feel like it would have been easy for me when Liz and I were dealing with all the sex stuff to just be like, well, I'm trained in all of this. Like, mm -hmm. I know what I'm talking about. Like, you're the one who's not seeing your blah, 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 you know? And it's like, I don't know. I just think we need to get like a lot more humble. Like, you know, <laughs> I've been doing this kind of stuff, you know, constant working on myself for quite a long time. And, and I always am learning new things about myself. It doesn't have to be this like, oh, we're broken or not broken, you know, yeah. I'm unwell on off switch. Like I just love, I just, I want, I invite people to be kind of more humble about it. Cause I know it's really scary, right? Like admitting your relationship might need some prep or help or whatever it is. It can be really scary, but I, I don't think it has to be like, I think it's just part of life. Like you said, of like, these are things we should learn over the course of our development of education and stuff. Right, right. Definitely. Well, before we wrap up, why don't you let everybody know where they can find your course at and where they can find and follow you and learn more information? For sure. Yeah. So um, the website is babyproofingyourrelationship.com. Uh, my Instagram is at babyproofingyourrelationship. Um, we have two courses. Uh, we have a course called Essential Prep, which is for first time expecting parents. Um, and then we have a course that's currently called together in the trenches that I think is going to be renamed to connect through the chaos is always fun <laughs> choosing brands and stuff, yeah. um, which is for people who already have at least one kid in the world. And, um, we have live versions of both of those. And we have an on-demand version of the connect through the chaos together in the trenches one on-demand version of the prep course coming soon. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love for you to check it out. I I, I want to offer anyone listening to this right now, um, 25% off if you want to, if you want to check out any of our products. Um, the only one that can't apply to is the live version of um, the prep course, because I teach that in partnership with a nonprofit, but it's only $50. So it shouldn't be too big of a lift. Um, yeah. But if, if you just use uh, morning Hava as one word at checkout, you'll get 25% off. So 
and I'm, you know, I interact with everyone on social media. Like I I'm on the account. So if you want to talk to me, interact with me, ask me questions, like I will, I'll write you back. Like I love these conversations. So, you know, talk to me, be a part of this, you know, conversation as, as we like to say. Yeah. Awesome. And I will link all those in the show notes. And then one more question before you wrap up, how do you take your morning Java? Hmm. Brazilian jiu-jitsu. What does that mean? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> well, I thought, so I was thinking of the definition of, oh, did you say Java? Yeah. Like your morning coffee. Oh, oh, I thought you were saying, how do I create morning Java? Oh, okay. You know what? That's not a bad question to ask. Okay. I'm going to answer both. I did okay, my morning yeah. Java black. <laughs> yeah. First nice. thing in the morning. And then I go to Brazilian jiu-jitsu and find my life force through my 6 a.m. martial arts class. That's awesome. And sorry for getting that wrong. That's what I thought you were No, asking. but I like that. I'm like, wait, maybe I should be asking people that too. <laughs> like, how do you get your morning hava going? I'm I'm yeah. working on mine right now. Like my kids are my alarm clock. So I'm just like rolling out of bed. I'm not at a place right now. I always say like, I would like to set my alarm so that like I'm up before them, but we have like kids crawling in and out of our bed. We're just like in it. <laughs> I like my sleep. So I'm like, I should wake up. I would like to, I'm not going to say should, I would like to wake up, um, to have a little quiet time in the morning before they get up. I'm just like, not there yet. <laughs> I still, it's like half the time I do it may not be not even a quarter of the time. The other three quarters I'm like, Oh no, I don't need that. I'm just going to run this bit and snooze. Like oh, this is not happening. It's so hard. Mm -hmm. Right. But then when you do it, you feel so good. So good. So right. Good. So it's like, why am I not just doing it? I know it feels great. Like, <laughs> why am I not just doing this for myself? But that's all right. Awesome. Well, I will leave all the links in the show notes. And I just want to thank you so much for your time, energy, and expertise with us today. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was really sweet to get to talk to you.